Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative alternative media. media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, glad you're back on the Investigative Journal on this March 23rd, 2018 day in our calendar. And uh, we're ending the week with a subject that I've dealt with before, and that is how Rome created Islam. Now, yesterday we talked about uh, World War III, and is it imminent? All the signs are there. We looked at what's going on in the world today as well as uh, Bible prophecy. And things are starting to add up, and Jerusalem is pay, playing a major role in that, as we saw. And even back when the Rome created Islam, a story that you'll never hear anybody in the mainstream talk about, or even in the alternative media, uh, is, a, is a huge story that everybody needs to know. So I'm going to go over it again, and I'm going to call upon... Uh, This presentation, which goes through uh, things that we've talked about before regarding Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera's uh, revelations regarding Rome's uh, creation of Islam and how he was told that by a cardinal, Cardinal Bea, a high-level Vatican cardinal. So why don't we do that right now on the investigative journal? But first, let me tell you this. If you're looking for a way to make some extra income, If you're looking for a way to work from home, uh, I'm working with a company right now, and you can contact me at gregbeacon at gmail.com. If you want to sell a product that is not even like selling, it's good for people, it's hemp for health and wealth, hemp oils, if you haven't heard about it, you got to try it. Hemp oils, hemp creams, and a whole bunch of products with this company, and I've tested it out. As a journalist, I've looked hard and wide. Uh, at these companies, and this is the best on the market, lab-tested uh, products that really work. you got to watch it in the hemp industry. There's a lot of products out there, so you got to make sure that you're not getting snake oil, that you're getting the real oil, the hemp oil that will help your health, and if you want to sell it to your friends, help your wealth. So call me, Greg Anthony, at, well, you, why don't you email me at gregbeacon at gmail. Dot com. That's G-R-E-G-B-E-A-C-O-N at gmail.com. All right, let's get to the Roman Catholic and Islamic connection. What I'm going to tell you is what I learned in secret briefings in the Vatican when I was a Jesuit priest under oath and induction. A Jesuit cardinal named Augustine showed us how desperately the Roman Catholics wanted Jerusalem at the end of the 3rd century. Because of its religious history and its strategic location, the holy city was considered a priceless treasure. A scheme had to be developed to make Jerusalem a Roman Catholic city. The great untapped source of manpower that could do this job was the children of Ishmael. The poor Arabs fell victim to one of the most clever plans ever devised by the powers of darkness. Early Christians went everywhere with the gospel setting of small churches, but they met heavy opposition. Both the Jews and the Roman government persecuted the believers in Christ to stop their spread. But the Jews rebelled against Rome, and in 70 AD, Roman armies under General Titus smashed Jerusalem and destroyed the great Jewish temple which was the heart of Jewish worship in fulfillment of our Lord's prophecy in Matthew 24 2. On this holy place today where the temple once stood, the dome of the Rock Mosque stands as Islam's second most holy place. Sweeping changes were in the wind. Corruption, apathy, greed, cruelty, perversion, and rebellion were eating at the Roman Empire, and it was
was ready to collapse. The persecution against Christians was useless, as they continued to lay down their lives for the gospel of Christ. The only way Satan could stop this thrust was to create a counterfeit Christian religion, to destroy the work of God. The solution was in Rome. Their religion had come from ancient Babylon, and all it needed was a facelift. This event happened overnight, but began in the writings of the early church fathers. It was through their writings that a new religion would take shape. The statue of Jupiter in Rome was eventually called St. Peter, and the statue of Venus was changed to the Virgin Mary. The site chosen for its headquarters was on one of the seven hills called Vaticanus, the place of the divine serpent, where the Sedana temple of Janus stood. The great counterfeit religion was Roman Catholicism, called Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, Revelation 17.5. She was raised up to block the gospel slaughter the believers in Christ, establish religions, create wars, and make the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication, as we will see. Three major religions have one thing in common. Each has a holy place, where they look for guidance. Roman Catholicism looks to the Vatican as the holy city. Look to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Yeah. And the Muslims look to Mecca as their holy city. Each group believes that they receive certain types of blessings for the rest of their lives for visiting their holy place. In the beginning, Arab visitors would bring gifts to the house of God and the keepers of the Kaaba were gracious to all who came. Some brought their idols and, not wanting to offend these people, their idols were placed straight. inside the sanctuary. It is said that the Jews looked upon the Kaaba as an no, outline to and loved the Lord with ready. veneration, until it became polluted yes, with idols. In a tribal contention over a well, Zom Zom, the treasure of the cup, and the offerings that pilgrims had given were dumped down the well, and it was filled with sand, it disappeared. Many years later, as al Muhammad was given visions telling him where to find the well and its treasure, the hero of Mecca, and he was destined to become the grandfather of Muhammad. Yeah, I'm carrying of looking for an Arab prophet developed. Muhammad's father died from illness, and sons born to great Arab families and places, like Mecca, were sent into the desert to be suckled and weaned, and spent some of their childhood with Bedouin tribes for training, and to avoid the plagues in the cities. Father also died. Muhammad was with his uncle when a Roman Catholic monk learned of his identity and said, Take your brother's son back to his country and guard him against the Jews, for by God, if they see him and know of him that which I know, they will construe evil against him. Great things are in store for this brother's son of yours. for future Jewish persecutions at the hands of the followers of Muhammad. The Vatican desperately wanted Jerusalem because of its religious significance, but was blocked by the Jews. Another problem was the true Christians in North Africa who preached the 
gospel. Catholicism was growing in power but would not tolerate opposition. Somehow the Vatican had to create a web to eliminate both the Jews and the true Christian believers who refused to accept Roman Catholicism. Looking to North Africa, they saw the multitudes of Arabs as a source of power. Some Arabs have become Roman Catholic and could be used for reporting information to leaders in Rome. Others were used in the underground spy network to carry out Trump's master plan to control the great multitudes of Arabs who rejected Catholicism. When St. August appeared on the scene, he knew what was going on. His monastery served as bases to seek out and destroy Bible manuscripts of the true Christians. The Vatican wanted to create a messiah for the Arabs, someone they could raise up as a great leader, a man with charisma, whom they could train, and eventually unite all the non-Catholic Arabs behind him, creating a mighty army that would ultimately capture Jerusalem for the Pope. In the Vatican briefing, Cardinal B told us this story. A wealthy Arabian lady, who was a faithful follower of the Pope, played a tremendous part in this drama. She was a widow named Khadija. She gave her... Benji, it's okay, Benji. She was to find a brilliant young man, who could be another religion, and become the messiah for the children of Ishmael. Khadija had a cousin named Wei Rakwan, who was also a very faithful Roman Catholic, and the Vatican placed him in a critical role as Muhammad's advisor. He had tremendous influence on Muhammad. Teachers were sent to young Muhammad. He had intensive training. Muhammad studied the works of St. Augustine, which prepared him for his great calling. The Vatican had Catholic Arabs across North Africa spread the story of a great one who was about to rise up among the people and be the chosen one of their God. being prepared. He was told that his enemies were the Jews and that the only true Christians were Roman Catholic. He was taught that others, calling themselves Christians, were actually wicked imposters and should be destroyed. Many Muslims believe this. Muhammad began receiving divine revelations and his wife's Catholic cousin Wei Rakhwan helped interpret them. From this came the Quran. In the fifth year of Muhammad's mission, persecution came against his followers because they refused to worship the idols in the Kaaba. <coughs> Muhammad instructed some of them to flee to Bosnia, where Negus, the Roman Catholic king, accepted them because Muhammad's views on the Virgin Mary were so close to Roman Catholic doctrine. These Muslims received protection from Catholic kings because of Muhammad's revelations. Muhammad later conquered Mecca, and the Kaaba was cleared of idols. History proves that before Islam came into existence, the Sabians in Arabia worshipped the moon god, who was married to the sun god. They gave birth to three goddesses, who were worshipped throughout the Arab world as daughters of Allah and idol excavated at Hayes. In Palestine, in the 1950s, shows Allah sitting on a throne with the crescent moon on his chest. Muhammad claimed he had a vision from Allah and was told, you are the messenger of Allah. This began his career as a prophet and he received many messages. By the time Muhammad died, the religion of Islam was exploding. The nomadic Arab tribes were joining forces in the name of Allah and his prophet, Muhammad. Some of Muhammad's writings were placed in the Quran, others were never published. They are now in the hands of high-ranking holy men, 
idolas in the Islamic faith. When Cardinal B. shared with us in the Vatican, he said these writings are guarded because they contain information that links the Vatican to the creation of Islam. Both sides have so much information on each other that if exposed, it could create such a scandal that it would be a disaster for both religions. In their holy book, the Quran, Christ is regarded as only a prophet. If the Pope was his representative on earth, then he also must be a prophet of God. This caused the followers of Muhammad to fear and respect the Pope as an other holy man. issued bulls, granting the Arab generals permission to invade and conquer the nations of North Africa. The Vatican helped to finance the building of these massive Islamic armies in exchange for three favors. 1. Eliminate the Jews and Christians, true believers, which they called infidels. 2. Protect the Augustinian monks and Roman Catholics. 3. Conquer Jerusalem for His Holiness in the Vatican. As time went by, the power of Islam became tremendous. Jews and true Christians were slaughtered, and Jerusalem fell into their hands. Roman Catholics were never attacked were their shrines during this time. But when the Pope asked for Jerusalem, he was surprised at their denial. The Arab generals had such military success that they could not be intimidated by the Pope. Nothing could stand in the way of their own plan. Under Way Rakwa's direction, Hamid wrote that Abraham offered Ishmael as a sacrifice the Bible says that Isaac was the sacrifice, but Muhammad removed Isaac's name and inserted Ishmael's name. As a result of this and Muhammad's vision, the faithful Muslims built a mosque, the Dome of the Rock, in Ishmael's honor, on the site of the Jewish temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. This made Jerusalem the second most holy place in the Islam faith. How could they give such a sacred shrine to the Pope without causing a revolt? The Pope realized what they had created was out of control when he heard they were calling His Holiness an infidel. The Muslim generals were determined to conquer the world for Allah and now they turned toward Europe. Islamic ambassadors approached the Pope and asked for papal bulls to give them permission to invade European countries. The Vatican was outraged, or was inevitable. Temporal power and control of the world was considered the basic right of the Pope. He wouldn't think of sharing it with those whom he considered heathens. The Pope raised up his armies and called them crusades to hold back the children of Ishmael from grabbing Catholic Europe. Crusades lasted centuries and Jerusalem slipped out of the Pope's hands. Turkey fell and Spain and Portugal were invaded by Islamic forces. In Portugal, they called the mountain village Fatima in honor of Muhammad's daughter, never dreaming it would become world famous. Years later, when the Muslim armies were poised on the islands of Sardinia and Corsica to invade Italy, there was a serious problem. The Islamic generals realized they were too far extended. It was time for peace talks. One of the negotiators was Francis of Assisi. As a result, the Muslims were allowed to occupy Turkey in a Christian world, and the Catholics were allowed to occupy Lebanon in the Arab world. It was also agreed that the Muslims could build mosques in Catholic countries without interference, as long as Roman Catholicism could flourish in Arab countries. Cardinal B. told us
Hamas and Vatican briefings, and both the Muslims and Roman Catholics agreed to block and destroy the efforts of their common enemy, Bible-believing Christian missionaries. Through these concordats, Satan blocked the children of Ishmael from a knowledge of scripture and the truth. A light control was kept on Muslims, from the Ayatollah down through the Islamic priests, nuns, and monks. The Vatican also engineers a campaign of hatred between the Muslim Arabs and the Jews. Before this, they had coexisted peacefully. The Islamic community looks on the Bible-believing missionary as a devil who brings poison to the children of Allah. This explains years of ministry in those countries with little results. The next plan was to control Islam. In 1910, Portugal was going socialistic. Red flags were appearing, and the Catholic Church was facing a major problem. Increasing numbers were against the Church. The Jesuits wanted Russia involved, and the location of this vision and Fatima could play a key part in holding Islam to the Mother Church. In 1917, the Virgin appeared in Fatima. The Mother of God was a smashing success, playing to overflow crowds. As a result, the socialists of Portugal suffered a major defeat. Catholics worldwide began praying for the conversion of Russia, and the Jesuits invented the Novenas to Fatima, which they could perform throughout North Africa, spreading good public relations to the Muslim world. The Arabs thought they were honoring the daughter of Muhammad, which is what the Jesuits wanted them to believe. As a result of the vision of Fatima, Pope Pius XII ordered his Nazi army crush Russia and the Orthodox religion, and make Russia Roman Catholic. A few years after he lost World War II, Pope Pius XII startled the world with his phony dancing sun vision to keep Fatima in the news. It was great religious showbiz, and the world swallowed it. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, Pope Pius XII was the only one to see this vision. As a result, a group of followers has grown into a blue army worldwide, totaling millions of faithful Roman Catholics ready to die for the Blessed Virgin. But we haven't seen anything yet. The Jesuits have their Virgin Mary scheduled to appear four or five times in China, Russia, and major appearance in the Americas. Okay, uh... What has this got to do with Islam? No, Bishop Sheen's statement. Our Lady's appearance is that Fatima marked the turning point in the history of the world's 350 million Muslims. After the death of his daughter, Muhammad wrote that she is the most holy of all women in paradise, next to Mary. He believed that the Virgin Mary chose to be known as Our Lady of Fatima as a sign and a pledge that the Muslims who believe in Jesus Christ's virgin birth will come to believe in his divinity. Okay, we're going to take a break back in three minutes on the investigative journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give.
If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Hi, Greg Anthony here from the Investigative Journal. And I've never steered you wrong before when it comes to talking about the truth regarding your political and social worlds you live in. And I don't plan on steering you wrong today when I say get involved in the hemp revolution. Hemp for health and wealth. I know of some of the best hemp oils on the market. If you haven't tried them, you have to. And pay attention. They're lab tested. So contact me, Greg Anthony at gregbeacon at gmail.com. That's Greg Beacon, G-R-E-G, be like boy, E-A-C-O-N dot com. And I'll hook you up with some of the best hemp products on the market. And if you want to become a sales associate and make some money selling hemp to your friends and family, do that. Contact Greg Anthony at uh, the investigative journal, Greg Beacon at gmail dot com. Greg Beacon at gmail dot com. The following following program program is labeled dangerous dangerous and off limits by the Supreme Supreme Jesuit Jesuit Command. command. But stay on the call, people. people. Listen up, up, and you you may may just just learn learn something. something. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, back for the last half hour of the investigative journal this week. And yesterday we talked all about uh, the imminent possibility of World War III and how Israel would play a major role in that. So today I wanted to present a presentation by a J.D. Farig. And he's asking the question, is Israel preparing for all-out war? Today's prophecy update... I want for us to focus in on what I would argue is the most significant prophetic development from just this last week. What I'm speaking of is the propensity for war to break out suddenly, keyword suddenly, and when, not if, when it does, I believe it will set in motion the fulfillment of specific prophecies in the Bible. I want to talk about three key prophecies that I believe are in play today and as such are beginning to come to pass with greater intensity and frequency, so much so It's the likes of which we have not seen in recent memory. First, though, let me mention that at the conclusion of today's update, I also want to talk about, uh, very personally again, the effect that understanding Bible prophecy can have on our Christian lives. This is something else the Lord has been 
ministering to me personally as of late in concert with the importance of my prayer life, but it's just how much of an impact Bible prophecy has had in my own life as a Christian. I hope you know I, I'm a Christian first, a pastor second, right? I'm just like you. Thank God I don't look like you. I mean, you don't look like me. <laughs> that totally came out wrong. This is why I try not to veer off from my notes. I, I do that, and that's why. <laughs> so the three prophecies, uh, you see them there on the screen, are, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to provide a summary of sorts, and I'll start with the first one, which is Isaiah 17 concerning the destruction of Damascus, Syria. It will be so destroyed, it will become a ruinous heap, and it will be uninhabitable, Damascus, Syria. The second one is Zechariah 12 concerning Jerusalem, which is that God, God himself, will make Jerusalem of all the cities, the city which he has chosen to put his name on, literally, by the way, he has made Jerusalem the intoxicating obsession of the entire world. Specifically, the dividing of Jerusalem, the moving of, the cutting up of those burdensome boundary stones in Jerusalem. And the third is Ezekiel 38 concerning a Russian Iranian led alliance of nations with Turkey. I see Russia, Iran, and Turkey as the big three, as it were. And they launched this attack against a confident Israel. I say confident because the detail we have in the Ezekiel 38 prophecy is that Israel will be very prosperous, very confident, very secure, very strong in their own eyes. Uh, interesting, I was uh, watching an interview on Fox News with Benjamin Netanyahu and Mark Levine. And Netanyahu made the comment that Israel has never been stronger. Israel has never been more prosperous, and they are. And by the way, that's the purpose of the Ezekiel 38 prophecy, is that Israel will become so prosperous, it's believed, and present company included, I believe that the prosperity in Israel chiefly is the natural gas find and the oil with it, but also the technology. Make no mistake about it. Israel has cutting-edge uh, technology that the world wants. Israel has it. And that's why they're going to attack a confident, prosperous, secure, and strong Israel to take a spoil. Okay. I want to begin with this report from Arutz Sheva on Thursday about how the IDF is preparing for all-out war. Let me quote the report briefly. The IDF, Israeli Defense Force, concluded a series of massive exercises on Thursday that mimicked all-out war on multiple fronts. The exercise, which was named Headstone 2018, began on Sunday and trained the IDF's general staff to, interesting word, quickly communicate with their subordinates in the event of, another interesting word, sudden war, with a special emphasis placed on the continuous functioning of different command centers and war rooms, even while under a missile barrage. Haaretz also reported on this, adding that the exercise simulated a multi-front war in which Russia intervened to prevent Israel from attacking Syria. A senior Israel Defense Force officer said, throughout the exercise, 
we examine various implications of the Russian presence in Syria. We practice everything that could be coordinated with the Russians and also what couldn't be. How we would operate without harming their interests in the region and on the flip side, scenarios in which the Russians made trouble. <laughs> For instance, by sending a message that Israel was undermining their regional interests. That's very interesting because that's exactly what Russia is doing. It's called propaganda. And by the way, Russia is not only doing it to Israel, as we're about to see, they're also doing it to the United States of America. Well... Clearly, Israel is keenly aware of the threats they face, particularly from the northern border with Syria. They're in what's known as the Golan Heights. On Tuesday, Reuters published a stunning report, and I mean stunning, about how Russia is saying, this is the propaganda, the U.S. is planning to strike Damascus. Oh, wow. And that they are pledging a military response. Russia is. According to the report, Russia said on Tuesday, this is Tuesday of last week, listen, it had information that the United States planned to bomb the government quarter in Damascus on an invented pretext and said it would respond militarily if it felt Russian lives were threatened by such an attack. Oh, interesting. You see what's happening here, right? So Russia will now potentially create this scenario where something happens in Damascus, and they're going to point the finger at guess who? The U.S. U.S. Us. What makes this so stunning is that it comes on the heels of a very revealing interview that Megyn Kelly had with Vladimir Putin on Thursday, March 1st, which we talked about last week. The reason I mention it again this week is because Putin stated, and I quote, there are two reasons why we would respond with our nuclear deterrence forces. A nuclear attack on the Russian Federation or a conventional non-nuclear attack on the Russian Federation or its allies. Oh, who's allied with Russia, Syria? Oh, by the way, North Korea. Of course, Iran, Turkey, et al. In other words, if, if there's any perceived attack, we're going to manufacture one, but anyway, if there's any perceived attack on us or our allies anywhere, particularly in Syria, because we're going to manufacture one in Syria, but particularly one in Damascus, then we will use nuclear weapons to respond. I think the uh, election is today. Not ours. You didn't, don't worry about voting. This is in Russia. Clearly, it's, uh, uh, you know, Putin will be reelected as the president of Russia. If this weren't bad enough, on Thursday, Arut Sheva published an analysis in which they quote Turkish President Erdogan, who in reacting to the news that the U.S. armed forces in Syria are building new bases east of the Euphrates River, said the establishment of these bases could lead to World War III. This is Turkey. I think they're reading off the same... Uh, playbook as one Vladimir Putin in Russia. Let me quote the Turkish dictator as Arusheva refers to him. Quote, the question arises, 
why the U.S. military bases in Syria are needed. And it seems that these bases are directed against Russia and Iran. Listen, I'm not the sharpest knife in the kitchen drawer. But if this is not Ezekiel 38, I don't know what is. Are you kidding me? Do you see what's happening here? In other words, we're the aggressor against Russia and Iran. Never mind that they're in Syria with Turkey, setting up bases, launching these unmanned, these drones into Israeli airspace. No matter that they're right there on the border, ready, at the ready to attack Israel. No, no, no. They're going to flip it around now. The attack is directed against them. Aww. The analysis goes on to say, observers think that the pro-Assad coalition will set its sights on southern Syria, that would be northern Israel, and will try to finalize the last stretch of the Iranian land corridor to the Israeli border. Iran has reportedly a huge number of forces deployed near the Israeli border. The article concludes with some mind-numbing numbers saying, the now seven-year-old Syrian war has cost more than 500,000 people their lives. That's half a million people. Let's try to put that into perspective. If the population of just the island of Oahu is 1.2 million plus another quarter of a million tourists that are on the island on any given day, am I, are my numbers relatively uh, close? Let's put this into perspective. That's like half of the population of this island dying in a war. Try to get your mind around that. It has left 1.5 million people disabled. That would be the entire population, including the tourists. And has displaced more than half of the population in the country. You know what that number is? 11 million. That's 11 islands of Oahu that have been displaced. And then they ask this question. Is a world war the next result of this seemingly endless conflict? I think we would do well to consider that question, especially in light of what we know to be true about Bible prophecy. And here's why. We are told in the Bible that this is exactly what will happen and begin to come to pass leading up to the seven-year tribulation, also known as the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel, also known as the 70th week of Daniel, and all of these prophecies that we're seeing in play today will ultimately and finally be fulfilled in and during the seven-year tribulation after the church is removed in the rapture. Now here's the question. If we're seeing prophecies that are fulfilled in and during the seven-year tribulation beginning to come to pass now? Well, then how close are we? If they're already starting to happen, is that not what Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. Key word, begin. When you see prophecies that find their fulfillment in the seven-year tribulation beginning to happen now, Jesus is saying, your redemption is close. Closer than you might even imagine. This brings me to what I mentioned at the beginning 
about the impact that Bible prophecy can have on our lives. I've been a student of Bible prophecy since I got saved over 35 years ago, but I didn't start teaching Bible prophecy until the year 2001 when, this is when I was on the mainland, my wife of 30 years this year spoke a word of knowledge to me. The prophetic word that God had given her was that he was going to use my ethnicity as an Arab born in the Middle East to reach multitudes of people. And I didn't really give it or lend it much creed at the time. Now, in retrospect, of course, I look back and I see that that word was from the Lord. Now, why do I share that? Because God has done a profound and deep work in my life in and through my understanding of Bible prophecy. It has changed my life. Now, keep in mind, back then I was, of course, much younger. I'm not going to tell you what my age was. You just use your imagination. You just fill in whatever age you deem appropriate. It'll probably be older than I was really at the time. But uh, I was in my prime at the time. I was not, not in the ministry. I had my whole life before me. <laughs> and I look back now some 17 years later and I say to myself, I have no regrets that I devoted myself to the study of and even the teaching of Bible prophecy because of the impact that it's had on my life and the work that God has done in my life because of it. It's been said that God cannot do a work through us unless and until he's first able to do that work in us. You see, that's what God did in my life over the years. He has certainly done that work in me. And I tell you, I cannot even begin to list all of the things that God has done in my life, the impact that Bible prophecy has had on my life personally. One in particular, there, there are many, but one in particular, and it's in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. Apostle John says this, All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. In other words, when you know how soon it could be that the Lord will come back. It has this purifying effect on the way that you live your life. I suppose you could say it this way. You get your spiritual house in order. Because you know that your redemption draws nigh. Well, Pastor, that was many, many years ago. My, uh, my children, uh, 19, 17, and my daughter will be 11 tomorrow, by the way. Time has gone so fast. Um, uh, we've had this conversation. And they're always like, you know, well, what about, you know, college? And what, you know, what if I want to get married and, and have children? And, you know, what if I want to, you know, experience life? And I actually had to pray and ask God to give me a word and an answer to that question. That's a good question. I mean, what are you going to say? Hey, stop living your life. No, we're to occupy till he comes. You're going to go to college. You're going to get married. And you're going to be doing those things until he comes. But here's the thing. There's not going to be anybody in heaven that's going to say, Oh, I wish the Lord wouldn't have come back until <laughs> I got married. Trust me on that, uh, by the way. But uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was obviously my wife's not in first service. But um, yeah, nobody in heaven is going to say, oh, I wish I would have experienced what it would be like to be married. And for children, <laughs> nobody in heaven is going to say, oh, I wish I could have just experienced what it would be like to be a parent. Nobody in heaven is going to wish that the Lord didn't come back when he did. To take them to the place that is 
indescribable that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, that Paul said it would be criminal to try to even explain it, where there's no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, no more cockroaches. <laughs> Last night, my daughter comes up and she's crying and trembling, and Baba, there's a cockroach in my room, come and kill it. I'm like, at 10.30, i got to get up at 3.30 in the morning. Of course, this is going to be a satanic cockroach on a Saturday night. Because i got to get up early on a Sunday morning. <laughs> so I go in there, and I'm praying, God, let me find this thing. And she says, it's a 7.47, it's flying all over the room. She's crying, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> you know, no need to fear. Baba's here. Oh, God, please let me kill this cockroach so I can get back to bed. So I go in there, and sure enough, it starts crawling out. And I'm whacking the thing, and I kill it. I says, here, Sabia, it's okay. Come, look. I don't want to look at it. No, come see it. So I can go back to bed. It's dead. She did. Anyway, so no cockroaches. And uh, <laughs> that was quite a... Okay, I'm going to cut it off right there, end the week, and if you agree or disagree with any of those statements made by J.D. Farrig, contact me at gregbeacon at gmail.com. See you next week on The Investigative Journal. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.